Some of the tactics being used are completely despicable. It was once home to Saddam Hussein's personal army, a vast secret place where the Iraqi military repaired its tanks and manufactured chemical weapons. Located north of Baghdad in an area called Tamiya, Camp Taji covers 13 square miles and is in the midst of the infamous Sunni Triangle. Saddam's birthplace to Crete, plus the towns of Ramadi and Fallujah, both centers of the insurgency, are within striking distance. And this was where hundreds of US troops lost their lives during the Iraq war. Camp Taji is one of, if not the largest military base in Iraq. Under Saddam Hussein, this was home to his elite Republican Guard. From 2003 onwards, it was home to American forces and then eventually scaled down until, of course, Islamic State swept through Syria and Iraq. In the summer of 2014, Iraq's future looked perilous. IS or Daesh controlled swathes of the country and were closing in on Baghdad. Iraq's army was well equipped and numbered 200,000 men. But faced with this new bloodthirsty enemy, four divisions collapsed. I can take the berries off, have a cigarette, we're just waiting for some more bombs. Three years after they left Iraq, British troops returned in a non combat role, part of a coalition of nations sent in to urgently retrain Iraq's army. Inside Camp Taji is a heavily fortified green zone, home to hundreds of coalition troops, including the UK training team. This is the ground element of the overall UK mission, Operation Shader. Four months into a six-month tour are troops from 1st Battalion, the Grenadier Guards. They head a battle group of around 400 soldiers, providing training at bases across Iraq. The, I think the key thing about the British training has been the expertise it provided to those who were going through the experience on the front line. And counter ID in particular is an area where the Iraqi army suffered significant attrition through expert emplacement from, from Daesh. I appreciate there's a few different units here, so I'm just going to split you up, whatever group I put you in. Counter IED training is, of course, in big demand. Out on one of Taji's many training areas, several hundred Iraqi troops turn up, including the injured. Taking lessons are sappers from 7-7 Armoured Engineer Squadron, plus a number of civilian contractors. An IED has five main components that we like to talk about. Actually, like now, they're coming across more of the simple IEDs, uh, pressure plate, using pressure plates, victim-operated IEDs, versus when I was here, they were using a lot of the electronic, different types of electronics to target you where they're, they're not there. But uh, now it's, you know, Dash, it's pretty sim simplistic IEDs. The UN says 33,000 explosive devices have been removed from Mosul since it was liberated, including 450 suicide belts. Finding them all beneath an estimated 8 million tonnes of rubble could take a decade. So I know that uh, the Daesh have left various IDs ranging from uh, devices put in medic medicine cabinets to target people trying to help the wounded uh, and just, you know, sort of building levelers that as soon as you walk into a building with a team, it will collapse the building on top of them. So some of the tactics being used are completely despicable. Many of the troops here spent time in Mosul and know all too well the tactics used by Islamic State to try and kill and maim them. There are four of us and we went inside a house and someone found an IED in there. I'd had the training so I was called in to try and defuse it. Dash had hidden it under a copy of the Holy Quran, what we call an anti-lift device. So if you picked the Quran up, the, the, the ID would go... Four years ago, this officer was in charge of a battalion near Fallujah. He told me how IS fighters came within 15 kilometres of the centre of Baghdad and the desperate fight to defend the city. In 2014, when Daesh emerged, we tried just to hold on to Baghdad. If this area had fallen into their hands, the whole city would have been lost. My division fought really hard around Baghdad, Abu Ghraib and Tamiya to try and stop them getting in. 
It was a very hard mission. When you fight against people with this ideology who are ready to die, it's very difficult to defeat them. The guards are just the latest in a long line of units that have now served here on Op Shader. And for around 70% of the troops here, this is their first operational tour. You know, it's been a hugely beneficial uh, tour for us as grenadiers and as engineers, um, but also um, you know, for the Iraqis, I hope we've added value wherever we could um, to assist them in, in the defeat of Daesh. Combat engineering is one of the key skills the British Army has been teaching here. This UK bridging system is designed to get vehicles across ditches or waterways on the battlefield. And for these Iraqi sappers, it's a real test of teamwork and communication, with a bit of competition thrown in for good measure. So from the beginning, we, we start with the, we make a horseshoe, which is three pieces of horseshoe, and then we put it onto the roller, and then we start building bay after bay. So the first bay, we boom to, the, to for a certain point to stop it from going into the gap. So every time we put a bay on, we boom it. Put a bay on, boom it. So today we did seven bays. Normally it takes one section, one, one commander and eight, eight sappers. But today we've got 54 students, so it should be quite easy for them to lift. At the headquarters of Camp Taji's vast engineering school, we met the officer in charge and asked him how the lessons taught here have been put to practical use in the battle for Mosul. Urban areas inside a city are the most difficult place for an army to fight. It's hard to know who your enemy is amongst all the civilians, and it's not easy to target them because they hide amongst them. ISIS is an enemy without morals and any appreciation of human life. Since 2014, many of my soldiers have been fighting in Mosul and across Iraq, and the training they've received here has been hugely helpful. Did he lose many engineers uh, to you know, IED explosions or uh, have the, the attrition rate? I can't give you an exact figure, but we lost a number of engineers. This was an extremely hard battle. We fought in a city against a brutal enemy that tried every trick in the book to kill as many people, civilians and soldiers, as possible. It wasn't easy, but in the end, we managed to defeat them. The Iraqi military doesn't release casualty figures, but the fight against IS is thought to have cost several thousand lives, some in battle, others captured and executed by Daesh as they swept through Iraq four years ago. Uh, for this scenario, it'll be 114. These Iraqi troops are learning the basics of battlefield first aid. Here teaching them a British Army and Royal Air Force medics. So a lot of the kit that we get um, in the UK, they don't get. So a lot of the stuff that we teach them is improvised. So if we're teaching them tourniquet, we teach them other, ways, other things they can use, like a belt or a shoelace. Um, but yeah, it's mainly the battlefield injuries, like amputations, um, gunshot wounds, that sort of thing. Among the students here are several veterans of the bloody battle for Iraq's second city. We mostly treated the soldiers for gunshot wounds and injuries caused by car bombs. Daesh fighters would come around the corner and just blow themselves up. For the civilians, it was blast injuries. As the terrorists withdrew, they blew up the buildings and they didn't care whether there were civilians nearby. And if they tried to flee to our lines, then the ISIS snipers would shoot them. Taji was once home to Saddam's Republican Guard. Better trained and equipped than the regular army, they were Iraq's military elite and were commanded by his son, Kusai. Today, 15 years after the US invasion, this is what remains of Saddam's military dream, a huge vehicle graveyard filled with thousands of tanks and vehicles stretching as far as the eye can see. Among them are dozens of these French-built self-propelled guns, Iraq took delivery of 85 of these in the mid-1980s, and they saw action in the Iran-Iraq war. But the arms embargo imposed after Saddam's invasion of Kuwait meant the supply of spares dried up and they were mothballed. So if it was a catastrophic bleed to the neck, it would just be a bandage. No Obshader is a tri-service mission. Working alongside the sappers here is a Royal Navy medic, teaching these Iraqi engineers how to apply a tourniquet. Although Iraq's military fought hard to defeat Daesh, the outcome could have been very different without the support of Western air power and Iranian-backed Shia militias. Islamic State sleeper cells are already active in parts of Iraq, so long term, can these troops bring lasting security? I think it's a really important point that, and actually many times I think the Iraqi army is slightly maligned. Um, 
Ultimately, they retook Mosul, a particularly complex operation in a very complex environment, much faster than anybody in the coalition had envisaged. And during our tour, we've seen them conduct numerous autonomous operations, providing security for the Shia pilgrimage in Karbala, for example, where they've done that very much on their own with great success. And so I think, you know, there's always room for improvement, um, but they're a very capable fighting force. Long-term, defeating IS will take more than just military power, though. Here in Iraq, it will also require solutions to some of the country's deep-seated political and social problems. The biggest, convincing a sceptical Sunni minority to trust the Shiite-dominated government in Baghdad. The UK says British forces will remain here until the job is done. What that means, of course, is another question, but it could well be some time. Three, two, one.